Okay, that's, that's much better. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Today we'll talk about uh, uh, the topic of enabling uh, 6G wireless networks uh, with Bayesian machine learning methods uh, with uh, primarily a single and a couple of other applications. So let's start. Uh, we all know about uh, Supreme Ice MIMA and uh, how it emerged uh, over the last couple of years as one of uh, center pieces of uh, uh, primarily because they are able to provide uh, various useful features that uh, can uh, that can still be achieved by traditional cell networks, but uh, with cell free paradigm, uh, the capabilities are much easier. So we have flexibility of deployment, uh, clustering of user equipment, uh, potentially small load from hole, and of course, uh, near optimal uh, resource utilization potential. Uh, continuing with uh, motivation for our work, this uh, ambitious setup uh, already gave rise to a great number a multitude of various uh, challenging optimization problems, which belong to resource allocation, topics of power control, load balancing, uh, and also other topics which contribute to those to like pilot assignment and control of design for scheduling. Uh, right now, I also want to point out an open question. Uh, how can we simulate and uh, preferably simultaneously solve uh, multiple problems from the set simultaneously all together. Uh, I will answer this open question at the end of the presentation, but I would ask you to keep this question in mind for a good discussion. So what uh, problem are we going to solve? Uh, what properties do they have? So, uh, what we're trying to do will belong to a non-convex uh, optimization with constraints, for example, SINR or energy budget. Then, of course, we must also ensure scalability of our solution for the whole uh, cell free network. Uh, and scalability, of course, uh, depending on number of access points and uh, user equipment. Uh, at the same time, uh, Emergence of data and popularity of data driven methods uh, leads to abundance of available network, network and sensory data, as we already know and heard from our previous uh, speakers over the last couple of days. Uh, but in addition, more often than not, we encounter high evaluation costs for objective functions in context optimization. And uh, in uh, very particular cases, Objective functions uh, are not tractable, so we cannot uh, help get an access to derivatives, and or in some cases they're just black boxes with no analytical expression. And lastly, uh, I want to point out uh, necessity in interpretability and trustworthiness. Uh, very recent topic that is related to uh, security and uh, insurance at our uh, solutions within the network be mac layer or physical layer operate correctly and secure. Uh, to uh, address all those uh, problems, properties, uh, we have Bayesian approach that ties them all together. Information theory, optimization, data-driven methods. Uh, we had a dispute uh, two days ago between information theory and data driven method. But is there a dispute? Because Bayesian methodology already ties it all together, the probabilistic framework. And of course, uh, uh, we must mention here the work uh, one of the one of workforces of uh, work workforces of uh, Bayesian modeling, uh, Gaussian process regression. And uh, in our case, what we're going to utilize is the Bayesian optimization. So uh, let's have a very brief overview of what Bayesian optimization is. 
Uh, so effectively, it is a, it is a methodology that uh, allows us to effectively optimize uh, very complex black box functions by uh, learning the surface of cost function, learning of the over time, and then finally finding the global optimum. Or in other words, our goal is to find the optimum while minimizing the number of evaluations of our objective function in one way or another. So based optimization in the loop, uh, we have our observations of our uh, black box system. Uh, and our goal is to build a probabilistic model of this function using Gaussian process regression. Uh, simultaneously, we will integrate out all possible uh, true functions uh, using this methodology. Sorry. Uh, the, second, the second key enabler of Bayesian optimization is to use uh, an uh, utility function uh, distribution to estimate and learn which point to sample next. And the process repeats itself. So it's uh, better to demonstrate it uh, visually. So let's say that we have a very simple objective function uh, denoted uh, as the red, uh, red dash curve. And then we have uh, four random samples from this function. And uh, where shall we sample next? Uh, so we use Gaussian process regression to approximate uh, those uh, data points, including, uh, and at the end we get uh, our mean estimation and uncertainty interval. So in the end, at this stage, it gives us our posterior over functions that uh, could have uh, generated the observed data. Uh, in order to, as I mentioned earlier, in order to know which point to sample next, we need to utilize so-called acquisition functions. Uh, we already know a couple of them which are most popular in literature. Uh, we can consider them as a baseline. Upper confidence bound, probability of improvement, expected improvement, uh, and in all of them, uh, x, uh, x uh, on time t or sample t with uh, cross denotes uh, the best observed point uh, to the date because it will continue to change. Uh, and uh, at the same time, this is the reason why Bayesian optimization gives us a good balance between uh, exploration and uh, exploration and exploitation trade-off. But let's observe this process uh, once again uh, in these figures from left to right uh, and then from top to bottom. Uh, so we sample, improve our estimation using GP model. We sample more. Uh, our confidence in sample points improves. The process continues, uh, continues to the point where we were finally able to uh, reach uh, very close uh, our, uh, to, to, sorry, not reach, but to get very close to our uh, global optimum. Uh, but what is uh, Bayesian in uh, Bayesian optimization? So, uh, the Bayesian strategy effectively treats uh, the unknown objective function as a random function and places prior over it. Uh, function evaluations are treated as data. And sequentially, we update our estimations. And finally, the posterior distribution uh, is used to fully construct acquisition function and the underlying objective, including confidence intervals. 
Of course, there is a lot of engineering work in addition to the beautiful theory. Uh, first of all, we must decide uh, what acquisition function to use, what uh, kernels should we utilize for Gaffin to regression. Uh, in other words, we have to design the prior uh, based on our uh, knowledge of the problem. Well, in most of the case. Uh, and of course, uh, there is also a very huge problem with uh, most of uh, Bayesian methods is that uh, Gaussian process do not scale well to many observations uh, and the computation is complex. Uh, of course, uh, here I speak about the most basic, the most traditional approaches. And uh, to this day, we already have uh, various uh, approximation methods uh, that allow us to reduce computational complexity or uh, support high dimensionality, but you will see it in a couple of slides. Right now, I want to return to the topic of uh, radio network and uh, where Bayesian optimization has already showed uh, itself as a very useful tool. Uh, still, up to this date, all uh, works related to this intersection were dedicated to uh, classical conventional multi cell networks. The first work was uh, dedicated to optimization of coverage and capacity uh, by means of antenna tilting and uh, transmitter power tuning in the downlink channel. Uh, within uh, the work, authors uh, benchmarked their version of Bayesian optimization against the multiple reinforcement learning methods. But still, uh, despite the fact that they have used uh, this beautiful framework, uh, there, there's still uh, evident risk of making coverage gaps, which uh, in context of 6G is uh, unacceptable. Second work, uh, and I uh, present them in sequential order as they were published, uh, was dedicated to open loop power control, uh, where uh, but uh, sadly, uh, the paper was written in a more or less tutorial fashion, and uh, authors uh, did not address the dynamic formulation of the problem. In other words, they completely ignored the issue of cold start and uh, issues with module selection, which uh, the latter is most critical. The third work uh, was dedicated to uh, some kind of inverse problem, if you can call it that, where user equipment tries to infer positions of access points uh, from only from timing advanced measurements in a multi path environment. Uh, the fourth work, uh, finally, was dedicated to cover up coverage optimization with uh, quite advanced tensor based GP surrogates. And uh, Finally, it comes to our work. We're continuing this line of research, this line of intersection by optimizing total ergodic spectral efficiency uh, simultaneously via uplink and downlink uh, data power control in, again, cell free networks. So uh, let's get to system setting. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, L MIMA access points, each equipped with uh, M antennas. Uh, and this number M is the same for each and every access point. Then we have uh, K single antenna uh, UEs, uh, users, uh, static, static users. Uh, third, we randomly allocate them across Cartesian plane, of course, assuring minimal distances between uh, pairs of users, pairs of access points, and pairs of access points slash user. Each link is uh, operates in a time division duplex. Uh, we also make an assumption that uh, low latency allows us to deploy a centralized uh, RM controller uh, based on data optimization. And uh, finally, this part of the whole network can be set via uh, adjacency matrix, simply. 
continuing with that, uh, we decided to use uh, uh, simple but uh, scalable version of closed form ego spectral efficiency, uh, which of course consists of uh, SINR, uh, where A is our antenna gain, uh, and it contains uh, within it, it contains terms indicated to uh, coherent and incoherent interference in addition to noise. But uh, what we're interested in are terms uh, W and uh, tau that uh, effectively are our optimization variables and they control uh, length of the fairness block and uh, W fractions of available symbols that allows us to effectively tune priorities of uplink and downlink transmissions between each pair of uh, access point and the user. And uh, in our system setting, we also assume that uh, each uh, user can connect to each and every access point. And then of course, it's uh, after that, it's a question of uh, transmission priority. Uh, then finally, to simplify the model and allow to uh, properly verify Bayesian optimization, we assume that uh, channel signal information is known or at least easy to estimate with uh, little to no errors. And uh, it's also for, for now, we assume that the transmissions happen uh, in uplink simultaneously. When it comes to transmission, uh, we can do that. Uh, and, uh, the reception by access points. <laughs> For a moment, I thought I am. So, the most important parts here are located uh, in the second section where we have our uh, variable, our control variables. Uh, yeah, I think so. To uplink, uplink power and downlink power for each and every link. Then it leads to a problem formulation uh, where we have a big power control uh, based on uh, fractions W. Uh, for the total max mean uh, total spectral efficiency per each user equipment. Uh, under, of course, uplink and downlink transmit power constraints. So our goal is to optimize those sets of variables for each and every link. Uh, when we speak about self remas MIMA we already speak about uh, very large numbers of points of users, hundreds, uh, 50s, hundreds, or even more. So, uh, of course, pro problems like that can be solved analytically. But uh, as we will try to, in the future, let's say, increase the number of constraints or add additional variables to optimization, uh, it will constantly lead to re-derivation of the analytical solution. And uh, there's always potential that uh, we will not be able to scale the solution up or will not be able to uh, address real world latency issues, for example. So in, in this case, uh, we say that uh, problem falls in the combinatorial domain uh, over a large parameter space. And as for previous works, which were trying to solve this exact problem, they always uh, link to various heuristics, like, uh, he again, heuristics with com combined with uh, traditional convex optimization methods with various relaxations. Uh, or second example, they try to treat uplink and downlink terms uh, separately or sequentially. So, so uplink first, then downlink, then again uplink, then again downlink. Multi-objective Bayesian optimization, uh, relatively, re relatively by uh, relatively recently by machine, by modern machine learning standards, uh, has received an ex extension into a multi-objective setting, uh, 
where within our basic optimization loop uh, we introduce a multi objective solver that uh, approximates the whole Pareto front over all our objective functions. And when it comes to objective functions themselves, usually each objective function is modeled by an individual uh, Gaussian process regression. And then again, uh, so and finally, instead of choosing simply the next uh, sampling point, we choose the whole uh, set of points to evaluate next as a new Pareto front. To further support uh, this uh, the problem in the setting, uh, we utilize the so-called noisy expected hypervolume improvement acquisition function, uh, the formulation of which you can uh, see here in equation eight and nine. Uh, it was proposed originally by uh, Donald Natal. Uh, What's important is that uh, it not only uh, has proven theoretical guarantees, but also allows uh, to operate with the noisy samples, noisy observations. Uh, but in order to properly compute it, uh, sadly, we have to rely on uh, Markov chain integration, which um, complicates things in terms of computational time and uh, and also complexity. So overall complexity and computational time with methodology is uh, unacceptable for real life application. But uh, to show the proof of concept, to show that uh, the solution is applicable to the problem, it works perfectly fine. So now let's proceed to first of uh, simulation results. Uh, for all our simulations, uh, we consider that since we speak about uh, two-dimensional two Cartesian plane, uh, we don't need two-dimensional beamforming, so we only uh, utilize uh, access points with linear antenna arrays, 128 elements each. Then, as I already mentioned before, each you with a single antenna, uh, the ratios and powers are initialized randomly. Uh, and when it comes to uh, max maximum powers, you can see them uh, in the third row of second column. And as for minimum distances, you can also see them at the top. And we also uh, consider the pilot assignment uh, is based on uh, very recent work that allows us to uh, compute them based on similarity between uh, channel covariance matrices. For the first experiment, uh, we took not the whole cell free network, but as a two example, a single link within this network and show uh, how noisy, how, how multi objective <coughs> Bayesian optimization with. Uh, noisy expected high volume improvement computes against uh, classical expected high volume improvement and uh, random Sobol sampling. So in the first figure uh, on the left, you can see uh, low high volume uh, difference for convergence uh, against number of observations. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as uh, was expected, uh, noisy version of performs them all. And uh, the two figures on the, on the right uh, contain Pareto fronts here, uh, where we fix uh, ratios and then optimize only uh, powers. Color here depicts uh, number of iteration, so the dark and the color uh, in the dots of Pareto fronts here, the earlier observation was made. And uh, once again, as you can see, uh, for noisy hypervolume improvement, we have very clear uh, straight Pareto frontier. While uh, 
other versions uh, fail to properly converge to it, given very limited number of observations. So as you can see, it's just uh, 25 iterations for the measure. We'll continue with a similar set of experiments, but here instead we fix powers and optimize only ranges. And we can see similar performance. Uh, now, uh, again, similar experiment, single link, uh, but we fix ratios and powers and uplink and uh, only optimize uh, ratios and powers in downlink. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging problem, but even in this case, uh, noisy happy volume improvement even continues to converge. So it's uh, possible to receive even sharper Pareto frontier. The final sort of experiments is uh, dedicated to what we all wanted to see, spectral efficiencies. Uh, all of those plots were uh, normalized in order to assure uh, proper comparison. But uh, each plot is dedicated to a single network uh, scenario. In the first one on the left, uh, it is a small network with five users, five access points. Second case, 30 users, 20 access points. And the uh, last one uh, contains 60 users and 40 access points. So in other words, 100 entities in total. Uh, we've also uh, done an experiment, larger experiment, which contains uh, in total 500 uh, units. Uh, performance was uh, quite the same, but of course computational time, even on uh, large cluster of GPUs was rather, rather poor. Uh, so yeah, so both sampling gets uh, stuck during the convergence. Uh, both versions of multi-objective vision optimization reach uh, a relatively decent uh, level of total spectral efficiency. Uh, but again, as we increase uh, number of units network further and further, this gap between uh, traditional hypervolume improvement and uh, multitask uh, noisy hypervolume improvement will grow even further. And confidence, interval, and confidence intervals will also uh, pretty much maintain close uh, to, to the mean, while for all others, they will maintain very large. So uh, for now, let's uh, draw a couple of uh, conclusions. Uh, so in our work, which was uh, recently accepted, uh, we showed that uh, it is possible to utilize state-of-the-art Bayesian optimization to solve uh, complex uh, radio recycling RRM optimization problems. Uh, it is really suitable and recommended for large networks. Of course, we must solve problems like computational complexity, computational sample efficiency. Uh, but at least we have a solution with theoretical guarantees. And of course, what, what, what's most important, modularity of Bayesian framework that would allow to embed the solution in uh, pretty much uh, any other uh, Bayesian model. There are still open questions to uh, discuss and uh, write about, like uh, how it will perform in dynamic network settings, uh, what, uh, how, and how will uh, sparsity of the network affect the final results, uh, how we can even further utilize high interpretability of Bayesian optimization and the output segregation uh, in combination with the all Pareto frontiers to properly uh, assess uh, transversions of the solution. And finally, what I actually want to have a discussion about is the question of uh, moving from simulators to uh, emulations. 
So it's a relatively recent topic, uh, but uh, in a nutshell, the idea of statistical emulator is to take your, uh, let's say, block structured simulator in this favorite domain. It would be your favorite link level simulators. And uh, how can we uh, harness uh, properties of Gaussian process regression to emulate behavior of those simulators and then run evaluations uh, instead of hours in just a couple of seconds. Uh, over the last years, we've a project we've also done a large work on uh, mass fantanary calibration, uh, where we applied uh, Gaussian uh, hierarchical Gaussian hypothesis with uh, composite with composite kernels at each layer to properly not only uh, compensate for distortions of fantana ray but also to properly forecast their behavior in the real environment. So currently this is a subject review. Uh, then we've also done uh, small work on variable system identification where we utilized similar Bayesian optimization methodology, uh, which was presented on uh, ISBA conference on the poster. And uh, finally, a uh, work related to the most popular topic of these days, viral channel modeling, uh, where we once again uh, successfully utilized the uh, hierarchical conclusion for celebration for uh, for, for time series forecasting of channel behavior. So that would be everything from my presentation for today. And uh, I'm more than want to hear your questions and have a discussion. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, for example, for example, wait. I think it's wrong. So. Yeah. So, for example, in uh, in the first in the first case, we will have uh, in total uh, twenty five objective functions. Twenty five parameters. Uh, and twenty five sets of parameters. Yeah, twenty-five dimensions. Twenty-five times you do one one dimension in the problem. Okay, and that's for all. So what is always one dimension? Well, I mean, yeah, I I don't I don't think it would be a single dimension because uh, uh, the government is a small group. Uh, it 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 will maximize. This uh, multi multi this multi dimensional surface consisting of uh, uh, two axes, two ratios for up and down, and another two axes for uh, up and down in power. The input in the input in each one of your things, one set of Yeah, yeah. In two, four, four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so. Yes, yeah, it's four. And, and then we should multiply it according to scalability of the network. So in the last one, we basically all of them are four basically. Yeah, yeah, but again, multi multiplied by uh, 60 and 40. So, so it's quite large. So, you do the uh, how, how exactly do I apply it? Well, that's actually a, a, a very long question to answer, but uh, yeah, perhaps I should answer it for you during the coffee break. Okay. Okay. Okay.
doing it long ah you have it yes. No. Okay. We are seeing the presenter slides. Oh, I agree. Then you stop sharing. Much fun, six. Screen two, right? Screen two, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone, uh, I'm Mateus, and I'm going to present my work on protocol emergence. So, here are Sarah from Google Labs, and I'm going to stay like a little bit more uh, since I arrived later, so I'm staying. Anyway, like the main problem that I tackle is trying to merge Mac protocols from scratch by using multi agent cosmic learning. And mainly, the idea here is to have like a, you put the network nodes in a system. They don't know anything about how should they proceed to deliver traffic across the network. And by leveraging like AI and the simulation environments, they start to learn how should they behave on the network, and then they emerge a, protocol, a communication protocol on the network. And in this case, you need some things, which is mainly the, the, def, the problem definition, which is in this case, the use case or use case, and the system model, which directly leads in the case of the case, since I'm using reinforcement learning, directly translates to the observation space. And the next one is you need to define the meta rules. So define what is possible to do in this problem, which is roughly what is, we call the meta protocol. So this translates to the actual space on the enforcement of the case. And lastly, you need to define your objective for your task. So it should maximize bit rate, minimize latency, which in this case translates to the reward. Okay, so a little bit, just an uh, introduction here. The protocol in this case would be like a, the convention that's the convention of a set of rules that enable the, the network nodes to share a channel and communicate with one another. And you can separate it into a signaling policy in this case and the channel access policy, or the control plane and the data plane. And our goal here, the proposition is to jointly learn the data and control planes together. And we do this by a more the proposition is then to emerge our wireless protocols by using multi reinforcement learning, augmented communication. And I have done this before, and my work was mainly on producing like new protocols on certain scenarios. So it's mainly producing solutions. But this work here is an extension and it's like a, how to study emerging protocols. How do you exactly study this and lay the foundations of protocol emergence and protocol learning? And so, why do we need this? First, the, one of the main uh, implications of it is to have like a customization. So you can produce application tailored protocols. So which translates to performance gains. And another one is optimality because you can actually reduce and search the all possible space of, pos of possible protocols. So you can search on the protocol signaling 
to look for the least signal in the response possible to like achieve a set of performance. And lastly, of course, you have automation. So you have a process that is very easy. You put your scenario, you click a button, you train and you emerge protocol and you deploy it. And so reproducibility and speed in this case. So how do you do this? So you do with much Why? So uh, the idea more or less is like we see the control plane as kind of the language of the network. So we are trying to do is learn a new language for an application, which is a communication test. So like some years ago, it started like this trend of like using much agent for social learning, should you emerge communications for an upset application? And so that's mainly why we use much agent for social learning. So in this case, you have multiple agents uh, interacting environments in this case, but differently from like uh, some of the other works here, um, of course, like we have a partial observable environment, otherwise you don't need to share information if they have all the information that they need. And how do you achieve operation in this case to help the others like the agents cooperate? You can have a single reward for the team, which is something that I use. And so you have a team reward. And in this case, you actually like incentivize cooperation and you add communication. So what is this? So instead of just having like environment actions that actually like uh, affect the environment directly, we have an extra information, which is you have a set of communication actions in the course. So the agents, instead of just deciding if it's going to transmit or not transmit, they also send an information which they don't know, in this case, the base station. And of course, like in this case, the initial vocabulary has no meaning. So they are going to learn the meaning as they start to like, uh, so try to do this task and learn together. So in this case, so that's why how you can actually learn a control plane. And the problem that we tackle is a simple wireless mutual access problem. And so the, in this case, the network nodes, they act like as agents, parallel agents, both the base station and the WIS. And they can change control messages, which is the communication actions through an error frequent uh, dedicated control channel, okay? Which is the red lines in the, in the figure. And the task here is that they have like a, a buffer that starts empty and you have like a probability of arrival for the users. And so it's a link transmission task. And the environment actions are actually the ones that directly affect the environment. In this case, they are taken by the UEs. This is a pre-link transmission task. And it's to transmit, to delete a packet from the buffer or to do nothing. Very simple. And they do this on a single resource shared channel with a set of erasure probability. And we model the observations as very simply for the users is the number of packets in the buffer, so it's transmission buffer. And for the base station is the channel stage. So it's idle, busy, or a reception from user one, user two, and so on. And this is mainly what you use. And the reward in this case, we use a, we have a term for each user. And the reward is basically like if you uh, delete the skill that was not received by the base station, uh, that's a loss of a packet. So if you give a penalization, if the base station received a packet from that user, then you receive a bonus. And you have actually here, it should be like zero otherwise. Um, and then we sum then those terms, and that's the reward of the system. And it's given to all the agents. Okay? So, what is the exact algorithm that we are using? Um, the, the bottom line here is to use, like, uh, we have the immediate PG, which is a training algorithm, the RL that we use, and we improve it with two techniques. The first one is to use what you call the true RL, which allows a better feature engineering in a simple feature forward network, which is the network that we use. The general idea here is that you basically use skip connections to feed the input to every hidden layer. And this allows you to go deeper without losing performance, which is this case here. So you have uh, two layers which work the best, and then when you start to increase the layers, the number of layers, you have to lose performance. So when you use like skip connections, you actually can go deeper with gain. And that's one of the main tricks that we use. And we have another one, which is jump start from post -method. And the idea here is to leverage uh, expert policy to accelerate the learning. 
And the idea is simple. In a, usually in Repos Metron, you start at the beginning, you search the whole task. So it's an episodic task here. What they do is simple. They have a like, guide policy that you, in the beginning of the simulation, you have an episode, and then like that's all. Like you have 24 uh, steps in your episode. So in the first 20, you use your guide policy, and in the last, in the last ones, you are going to use enforcement learning. And this allows the reinforcement learning test to be like kind of easy in the beginning. And once you pass a certain threshold of performance, you increase the time that are like uh, you reduce the time of the guide policy, and then like until the end, it becomes only the reinforcement learning. This accelerates the, the learning a lot. It's a very simple trick. So we use this in order to leverage the, the baseline to learn a protocol. Perfect. So let's look at some results. Uh, in the beginning, like, let's try to motivate this. So the first one is like, do we really need to emerge a protocol? So emerge versus compare, uh, emerging versus learning. So here we are comparing uh, protocol emergence, which we basically are learning the control plane vocabularies, the control plane policies, and also the channel access policies, all are learned for the base station and also the UIS. And then we have a second one, which is the protocol learning which basically the base station follows a baseline, which is a great, great, uh, great base solution. And while they, is, they, they need to learn the control plane, which is basically the control policy that is uh, used by the base station and also the data plane, okay? And then we have the last one, which is basically we, we are only learning the channel access. So both the control plane of the users and the control the, the whole base station, like uh, follow the great base solution in this case. Okay, so let's see. And mainly here, we have the learning curves. Of course, emergence way harder, so it takes a little longer to, to learn, of course, but in the end, the performance is better when you use protocol emergence than the other ones. Okay, but interesting enough, the channel access learning is kind of limited in performance because of the control rules that are like uh, set up. So it cannot pass the, the baseline that is used, which is the computation free, like the base solution. So you have like a scheduling grant that is sent and then acknowledgement and then it uses the S for request. It's a very simple solution. And however, when you look at the, the gap kind of increases is a very interesting case here. Here I'm plotting instead of the average, I'm plotting the best protocol because that's what you care about. Is the one that's going to be deployed. And so we are reducing, look at the transport block rate and the performance. So all the solutions, they kind of have like a limit that they cannot really go up or over it. But profit of learning with the case, it starts to get better and better, like to, and adapts to the lower cases. Um, so better trade positions. So like it's a powerful solution. And the bottom line here is that the channel access learnings learning follows the rules that are set up, has to follow for the predefined protocol that is used. Protocol learning allows breaking some of the control plane rules. So we get a little better in performance and emergence allows new rules to, to, to arrive. So that's why you have a, such a better performance here. So now we can go back to the, kind of the framework that I'm proposing here in the first step is obviously producing the protocol. And here it's mainly like uh, you are doing like a solution design. We compare three solutions, which is like uh, the training algorithm by itself. Then you add the feature engineering idea, the URL. And of course, you add another one on top of it. So you have three solutions with jump start and cosmic learning. Okay? So, here you have the learning curves. This is like the easy case, which you use And mainly here you have the learning curve, and then here is the box plot of the best plot products producing the learning, okay? So everyone has kind of the same performance here, all the algorithms, but when you start to get a little bit harder, then you start to see the differences. And like, The main conclusions from here is that leverage of experts accelerates the learning a lot. Like even if the same, the, the performance in the end are kind of similar, like you have a way faster learning by using like a, by using a prior policy to, to accelerate the learning. And using the guide policy, 
allows two things that are very interesting. The first one is like you can use a general purpose protocol as a base to actually generate your application tailored one. Okay, so you kind of repurpose the protocol that you have, or you can use a not so good application failure protocol and then improve it by using this. Okay, so it has this, uh, this interesting uh, effect. However, it has a little bit of a problem because you cannot search on the signal space because you are limited by the protocol of the baseline that you use. Okay, so that's a little bit of a problem. And interestingly, if you are using only machine learning or only reinforcement learning, you can have kind of search on the vocabulary. So we are here we are mainly changing the amount of symbols on the control plane. So basically the number of communication actions on the uplink and downlink. And this is kind of where more or less the best baseline has performance. So, and this is like the vocabulary of the baseline. So it's two and three. And the main conclusion here is that the only constraint is that you need a downlink vocabulary bigger than two, bigger or equal to two. So this case here is enough. So you have minimal signaling with good performance here. Okay, that is that's actually really nice, but uh, how do I know if a protocol is better because it has a better channel access? Oh, so. huh? uh, Sorry? Down down in vocabulary is the number of symbols in the communication oh, actions. The communication actions, the number of communication actions you have. Okay. This is also not very clear to me. So, what do you mean with, with two, for example? Do you mean that you have two symbols that you have in mind? Are you alive, or that you only have two types of messages? Two types of messages. So, two, only two messages. Only two messages. Zero, zero, and one, one message doesn't have information. Right? No, it's just a yeah, exactly. Those conditions, I'm oh, sorry. They have to kind of understand what OGE is. Uh, do they agree on the meaning or they actually agree with the meaning that they mean? Well, if they, the idea is that in the beginning they don't know, but as training goes on, they start to actually agree. And everybody agrees. Yeah. yeah, actually, because I use parameter sharing, so the users, like, they have to, to like, it's a more or less of the user, they have to agree with the understand correctly what the base station is trying to do. That's the idea. But the policy is the same for everyone. But the base station is also Yes. So, okay, I can ask you later because that you have that kind of genius agent. This station is one of the genius agents. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like they use the same network, but like different types of cross between networks. Do you have to keep that every, every option? So, you transmit and you get the control of the feedback. Well, you, if you transmit, you're um, like taking an environment action, what you call which is a transmission, yeah. and you also, at the same time, you need to transmit a uh, communication action, which is the control right. so, action at that point. Okay. okay, so they are not exactly like in the beginning, don't really correlate, like, oh, I'm, I'm transmitting, then I'm seeing year zero. In the case of the emerging protocol, not really. Uh, that's, that's the point of it. They start to learn about it, how to do it. Okay. Um, so one main thing here is like, Mateus, how do you know if like uh, the protocol is getting better because of a channel access policy that is better or it is because they are starting to coordinate better? How do you know this? Well, by looking at the natural KPIs, you really can't. So the second point of the framework is to evaluate the coordination. And how do we do this? We can evaluate the cross node coordination by using what you call the coordination matrix, which is an emerging communication matrix. And in this case, like we use two metrics and both of them are derived from the mutual information. And the point is that the first one is what you call instantaneous coordination, which is the mutual information between the message that the agent receives and the environment action that the agent takes. Since it's on environment actions, we only evaluate this for the users. And this was proposed in this paper here uh, from Natasha Jacks. And then you have like a, a, we propose another one, which is the immediate reply, which is the mutual information between the message that an agent receives and the communication action that it takes. And this is mainly calculated for the base station, 
because the base station works as an orchestrator for the, uh, the system. <coughs> information from the, from the users, then it controls them, uh, orchestrating and controlling the, the, the system itself. Okay, so let's look a little bit of what exactly does it. So we have here the, the good goods in terms of the standard coordination. And by, by when we prove the learning algorithm by MIDI DPG, uh, the URL and then jump such across my journey, they all get better in terms of good good, but also start to coordinate better. Okay, so mainly, like I see, uh, coordination leads to better performance, and this also happens with the immediate reply. It gets we have the collision rate here, that you get like a better, uh, your learning algorithm gets better, it leads to better coordination, and also to a better, like a collision rate in this case. Okay, simple. And the last one is, okay, I do have a but how can I compare second protocols? Like, uh, how do I know the trade-off? Like this, the, when I reduce the signaling, am I getting like a higher collision rate? What's the trade-off that I'm paying? And in this case, we have the step of protocol profiling. So how to evaluate the trade-offs involved here? And mainly is to try to characterize a protocol in terms of the natural KPIs and also the coordination metric. And main ones that you propose is, of course, the good future is the main uh, KPI here for this application is the KPI of interest, interest, but you have like collision rates, which directly leads to energy efficiency because energy efficiency in this case here is the number of received the good put basically divided by the amount of energy that is put into the channel. So it's mainly the receptions divided by the number of trans the, the transmissions that are made. And then you have delay. In this case, we use the average age of formation. And then you have the reliability, signaling overhead, of course, and then the two coordination metrics. Okay. So when you have this step, there are interesting things that you can look when you're comparing protocols here. So the first one is looking at the difference between protocol emergence and well, the channel access learning. Well. When you improve it, you get lower delay. So this is the main consequence of like uh, why you get a uh, very good. Okay, that's nice. And interestingly, uh, let's look at those two cases, which is mainly the learning from scratch, basically, and then that's the reduced signal here. This is like minimum signal that is possible, so that the best solution for that for carbon size study that you use. And Really, there is no big, uh, you have a slightly higher delay when you uh, increase a little bit, the, you reduce signaling, but really there is no, no, no trade-off involved. Like the reliability is the same. And so actually like the cost involved from moving from like uh, reducing the signal, it's not really uh, translated in any of like, uh, the KPIs. So great. And the last one, it's a very interesting thing is like, uh, interesting uh, application of protocol emergence is the idea that you can control the profile of the protocol, the characteristics by changing the reward. So here, what I did is I used it like the reward that I explained it, and I added a term to penalize uh, collisions. Okay, so I change a little bit the reward, and it translates directly into uh, you reduce the collision rates. And well, you increase the delay, but the input is more or less the same. So you can control the characteristics of the protocol that you're emerging. I want to use the viewer. Great. How can you find this learning algorithm? Uh, it's log of the vocabulary size. And then lastly, okay, so I look at it from the profile of the protocol and I look at it and I see what they are trying to do. Uh, what actually they are going for. But what exactly are they doing? So you need like to interpret the protocol. And in this case, you need to interpret and explain the, the communication actions. So the idea here is to study the meaning of the control messages. And we are focusing here only on the downlink messages for the WIS. So, so it's the downlink, uh, the messages that are received by the users and the effect of them on the environment actions. And to do this, we use a very uh, cutting edge um, technique, which is called conditional probabilities. And 
So to explain how we can do this by using uh, looking at the conditional probabilities, we mainly are drawing here the conditional probability of the of when it's given that the action is taken, what's the probability that a message was received. So by looking at the baselines, it's very easy to understand. So for example, the message to is clearly the acknowledgement because it leads to a deletion. And then the one is really the, the scattering range because it is a solution just that. Okay, simple. And in the case of the convention based solution here, we have an acknowledgement for the, but it's basically they have like a probability of arrival, but they have acknowledgement as well. So the acknowledgement is one message and the other really has no effect because you have a probability of transmission. Okay, so this is how you can do it. Let's do it for the emergent protocols. In looking at the protocol with the guide policy, uh, of course, it looks like the baseline because it's training it. Yet. So <coughs> the message true is really the acknowledgement here. But, but there is an interesting thing that happens. Sometimes it actually leads to a, a transmission, and we also have this case here. So what exactly is happening? Mm, this basically means that the meaning of the message itself, the instruction that is like taken by it, depends on some conditions. And this fluidity of meaning is actually even more noticeable when you actually run from, from scratch a protocol, which is this case here. So you have a message that clearly like excuse it from deletion, but sometimes it isn't true like clearly for transmission. So like the meaning of a message depends on the context that is received. And this is actually the reason that the minimal signaling can coordinate really well in this case because it's using the same message to like uh, as a scattering grant and also as acknowledgement. So that's why you can reduce the signal, which is a really great property of uh, the, the emerging protocol in this case. Oh, of course you can do it with like a, by basically like doing a, a rule based solution, but it's kind of hard to find what exactly is the point. So automation here is really the key. And like to end a little bit. So some of the perspectives here, there are many. Um, so like producing a protocol, you can extend the scenario for frequency resources and channel definition. And for study coordination, I mean, uh, you can propose other metrics, of course, that is also the, the square value the cross node continuation and use such metrics as keywords to motivate a, a prior coordination. Okay, so like you add a term for the, the, the metrics, coordination metrics for the, to, to motivate better coordination. And you can compare the protocols, uh, the effect of the different keyword functions. And the most, uh, let's say, the, the, the one that has like the, the most possible application, uh, like uh, studies here, is the protocol impact interpretation because explainable AI techniques for enforcement are like kind of like, and so there is like a, you can focus on better techniques to interpret the emergent communication, XAI techniques, decision tree processes, and all. And this framework can kind of be applied to other make other layers, of course, and be applied to like communication control code design. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I understand like how um, the mechanism for learning process how you actually convert this uh, to the message and the vocabulary itself. And also this thing like in our head because you could have I mean users that want to communicate information, but then first you need to also agree on the language. Yes. And then, um, that the uh, direct communication between all agents or only agents in the base station? Only the users in the base station in this case, because it's like, a, yeah, it's, right, right. technically a simple case. But, but in the signaling overhead, you only consider the, the size of the. Of the uh, it's the, the control plane. Right. Right. How many extra communications do you do that? Well, they, they, they need to do like, a, they, they need to send a communication action. Every uh, step of the of it. It's not like a, oh, I'm not sending a communication action right now. I'm not sending a control plane information right now. They always have to send it. So, so the 
the swap plan, you will have set up the hotel in Marina only for a trip back from Asia. Yeah, in some cases, yeah. And yeah. during the C9 hour period, only with the size of the vocabulary. Uh, I mean, very optimistic, isn't it? Because you're going to increase the amount of people. Something. Yeah, makes sense. You can control how so the population varies. The population varies. Yeah. And the signal in the are different realizations than in terms of lower. Yeah. Uh, is this a kind of only working for these scenarios or you try to see if the brain number will be 16 to, I don't know, 50 and 500? Well, it, yeah, kind of. You increase the number, the overhead when you increase the number of users. I understand so that more. maybe there's a phenomenon that are non-linear. So somehow the protocol now breaks down and the other is the version of the That's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. You have an encounter like convergence issues. Don't the market German processes is hard because sometimes it's Yeah, like when you increase the number of users, of course, you have to issue, whatever. No, not this probability, but if you're saying convergence, that sometimes that's converging and it takes longer, but it's more like Yeah, it converges. Like increase the number of the thing is sometimes the conversion of very but solution like it cannot pass a certain threshold, which sometimes is below, depending on how many users you have, it's below the, the, the baseline. Um, but that's uh, I'm not exactly focusing on producing a protocol here, so I'm not trying to like having a better learning solution itself. Like my 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 goal in this case is mainly like uh, laying the foundations of how to do this. Um, Definitely, I mean there are many things to the source, not trying to criticize. <laughs> <laughs> But like yeah, that. Yeah, but it's very First of all, it's uh, I want to interpret the definitely of the solution, but uh, I think we kind of passed on it at the very end. What? Interpret the builds of the final product. So, right now, how you interpret the uh, uh, generic tools, and uh, can you learn something useful as an engineer from the generic synthesized problem? Oh, you mean like if I look at the, the, <laughs> what they are doing, interpreting what they're doing, and then producing like a protocol that looks like it? Yeah, for example, you know, instead of using the, the, the learning yeah. solution. Okay. Uh, like I'm using it in a lot, so like the limits of what you can write is basically like expandable AI. And I went for this conditional probability here, but I actually tried other things, such as Shapley values, uh, which is kind of hard to put in a paper. So, but it's possible to explain all the cases, what they are always trying to do by using like uh, expandable AI, maybe. Like you can try to explain the neural network. Uh, and that's it. But like, uh, that's the limit of what. And as I said, like the issue is that ex Explainable reinforcement learning is kind of a lacking field. We have like some explainable AI solutions, but reinforcement learning, uh, not really. And when you go like multi agent reinforcement learning explainable, not anything there. Yeah, and uh, I think I have a question what about uh, robustness against the precise effects and the which form of the uh, if is it in this case. So, like, well, uh, you just clarify when I speak about the uh, of the inside of the so I yeah, we could do uh, work for uh, 2019. But, like, the, the point the is that, yeah, the, 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 side of the, the thing is that the robustness to adversarial policies is set up by the learning algorithm that you use. So if that's exactly like an issue that's like, which is not something that I do here, but if there's like some some priority, then you can you just use an algorithm that actually like is robust to it. 
it's set up by the learning algorithm. And like this framework, I use MDG, DDBG, but like you can use anything that's like multi agent, really, as long as, as it's capable of dealing with the non intentionality issue of the multi agent enforcement learning problem. Okay. But, but that's exactly my point. Uh, one thing is to train a first and go back. And then deploy the success protocol. But another thing is where I think our common goal is, is to have a kind of continual uh, protocol adaptation in the real world at uh, the problem that I mentioned about several times kind of applies uh, exactly that. Not, not to a lot of money to real world. Well, we can, like, in this case, you are talking about is like you are doing online learning, right? So that's a special case. Like, the solution that I'm, doing, I'm going for here is not online learning. It's actually learn offline and then deploy it. So it's kind of a different, right? And, and, like, if you are going for online learning, you need dependent learners. And I have tried this, and independent learners cannot solve this problem. So in other words, now it's in uh, by or in other words, it cannot be deployed in the real And also nowadays you don't have the technique for this. The point is like uh, it's, it's it's like you ask, oh I like can I deploy right now uh, autonomous driving with my constant learning? Not really. Like even the joints traffic is like eight eight joints most of the solutions it's what you try to do uh, so even the learning techniques are not there yet where you can deploy this in real life the point is that maybe for 6g the the much reinforcement learning algorithm is going to be on that scenario and then you can deploy it you 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 have done um uh, I think I saw you were doing something on uh, pitch random for interpretability that you haven't shown, right? <laughs> yeah, like the one that I showed you is like the, the original version, which is the Shopify values. Uh, it's a little bit hard to actually put that application. So I went for the simple, the simple and the actual effective solution of using conditional probability, which explains the whole thing and is easy to look at it and kind of derive it. Uh, but when you, you go for like a spinnable AI tool, it is like great for deriving what is happening, interpreting it, explaining. But like if I'm going to put that on paper, I need to write it without any plots and not really. But, but like I can't really find what exactly they are going for. But the, the issue is that when you use those techniques, you are doing sample by sample. So you are, you are studying case by case. So what is happening when I receive a tool? What, uh, what's the output of it? And what's the, the contribution of each of the features um, to the output itself? And, and you're uh, learning for each feature individually? No, no. Like the, you, you're learning it's like post hoc. So explainable AI is post hoc. You train, you pick the, 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 your model, and you explain it after. Okay, so it's after, it's trained already, and then you look at it. It's like, a, try to translate your practice. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I saw that you were saying that you can in the Okay, I thought that was I don't I don't I don't
Maybe it's in the computer. Can I send you the presentation? Yeah, but you. You have also you also have um, Linux in your computer, right? Yeah. Could, could you? Just ask Andrea to to stand up, or you can jump over him. So that was a problem or this is the problem? Both, no. <laughs> um. hmm. Can you open Zoom from the left? 
Hi everyone, my name is Ayumi, uh, ESR at Word Sensing, and uh, I'll present my last work. Uh, the research topic about attacker identification in LoRa One uh, through physical channel fingerprinting. Now, the main objective. We want to ensure network traffic safety and security uh, in LoRa One, and um, to do so, we would like to build a model to be able to identify the attackers in the network. This is the main component of the uh, LoRa One network. Started by the sensor, we have the connected with the gateway. Every sensor connected at least with one of these gateway. Then we have the a network server and the application. Now, the question here is the LoRa One secure enough? Now, there are mainly two types of security: signature-based security and another type uh, behavioral-based security. The one implemented in LoRa One is the signature-based, where it depends on uh, implemented two uh, keys, one in the level of the network uh, uh, key and another on the application uh, layer. Now imagine this scenario. We have an important uh, building, nuclear power station or wireless tunnel constructed monitoring and Assume this scenario where I am the attacker and I want to attack the one of these buildings. I will do the following. First of all, I will start by a passive attack, snapping the traffic of this network because I can't enter inside the, this station. I will be outside of it and start implementing passive attack where uh, sniffing the, the traffic of this network start to analyze it, understand the behavior pattern for each one of these network, uh, the spreading factor, frequency, sampling rate, even the transmission power. Then I will select one of these sensor to attack. Simply I will start by, because the, the security in, in IoT in general, it's not so complex, even uh, we are implementing uh, uh, two uh, keys, but they are not so complex because of the uh, constraints of the IoT devices. For this, for this reason, it will be easy for the attacker after sniffing uh, the traffic for a specific uh, sensor to implement, uh, for example, key extraction attacks. After that, the attacker, I will, uh, assuming if I am the attacker, I will have the keys, both of the keys for the uh, specific targeted sensor. Then I will start after that by wireless packet injection. 
I will start sending packet to uh, to the network server, um, claiming that I am one of the sensor belonging to this network. Now, none of the network server or the application will be able to detect or to discriminate if I am the uh, network, if I am the node who belongs to the network or I am the attacker because I am sending, uh, encrypting the data using the uh, two keys. For this reason, we wanted to use the location as a fingerprint. Now, this solution, this problem, we are uh, provided for a monitoring solution where the IoT devices, the sensors, they are on fixed location. Now, we know that the signal characteristic generated from a specific sensor, it's um, related to the position of that sensor. So the signal characteristic, the received signal characteristic for the target device, it will be different than the signal characteristic received uh, by the attacker uh, device because they are allocated in different position. And we want to use this idea to be able to tell, okay, this receive packet without looking to the ID, to the device ID inside the packet, we want to tell, okay, what is uh, this feature characteristic for this packet, which means this metadata belong to this sensor. Now, assuming at the beginning, the majority of uh, installation cover every, gate, every sensor by one gateway. Now, in, in, in this case, assuming, for example, uh, I will cover the target, the, I will collect it, uh, uh, the bucket from one gateway, and it will be gateway one. Now, if the target device and the attacker device, they are far within the same distance from the gateway one, they will deliver more or less the same RSI value. And that SSI value, it is one of the main metadata. It will give me an indication about the position of the sender. Even if I am the attacker and I'm far or near from the gateway and it's not on the same uh, circle of the target device, I will, because I already uh, understand. Um, evaluate and calculate, estimate what is the transmission power of the, ta of the target uh, device, I will increase or decrease the, the transmission power so to deliver uh, the packet with the same RSSI that the target device deliver its packet. But in the case we add another gateway, it will be um, more easy to discriminate between them because if I am the attacker and I want to adjust my power with, for one gateway, I will fail to adjust it to the second gateway. But for more security and to be able to discriminate between all of these devices, we need to add the third gateway. Because in case there are where symmetric position, the attacker will be able to, uh, in case uh, to adjust the power for both of these um, gateways. Now, the main assumption here that the attacker and the target node, they are not on the same, they are not collocated. They are not on the same position because if the target device is be able to, um, within the same location of the, uh, let's say the, tar the attacker device within the same location of the target device, there is no need to uh, use wireless to attack this uh, uh, target device. And in the first work, we study um, what is the minimum distance it should be between the target device and the attacker to discriminate between them. At this time, we are using a real data set. It's an uh, in, indoor real data set uh, collected from a building, uh, consisted from 80 floors. Uh, it has um, 14 million messages from about uh, 300 uh, from uh, 390 sensors 
in duration about six months. And uh, this sensor uh, distributed uh, the installation for them in five, uh, five floors. And the maximum distance between the sensor and the gateway is 64 uh, meters. Now we choose from this uh, number of sensors from the whole data set, we just choose 165 because these sensors, most of the time, uh, they are um, covered by the three gateways. Now, this is the selected features that we decided to um, have it like to calculate it uh, every time we receive the back. Now, this is the receive success percentage, which means that in case I'm uh, receiving the bucket from the three gateways, it will be one and zero otherwise. Yes, please. Are your networks supposed to be very long distances or this is a different configuration of other networks? It actually, mainly, yeah, it is for long distances. And, but uh, this is the only data set that we found it. It's sorry, uh, let's say for indoor and uh, most of the sensor covered by uh, three gateways. This is uh, one thing. But the, the second thing, uh, even if it's, uh, let's say, um, for long range communication, but mainly in industry, I, I could tell you that within just, it depends on the application. For example, if you go for for the tunneling application, it will be different than the agriculture because the, the constraint, the, the obstacles, it will be different. So you will need another gateway to install it somewhere. It's so less, I would say five to ten kilometers from the open air. Yeah. A little bit less in, in city in town. Uh, yeah, like, the was that you need to have an open air from very long distances, but that was. Why I was asking that. That's right, but it is all, um, also very useful in buildings because you can cross walls and everything, so you can build the sensors from the basement. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was my question. Like, I, yeah, I, I, even, I, even if you if you realize when I say here, not, now all of the sensors within the same building, but we are not receiving, and the three gateways, we have just the three gateways within the same building, but at the same time, we don't receive the, the message from all of these sensors all the time, because it depends on how many people within this building, how the, the structure of the building. So, so is, is it your, your um, sensing data set, you said, or? Is no, actually this is it's collected in Zorik, I think so. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it's one building, yeah. yeah. Other question? Then here is the Abulian uh, value. It's uh, gateway. Uh, now this number it's the name of the gateway in the data set, and we left it uh, like this. Uh, gateway. Uh, this it's like an indication. One if we receive it from at this gateway for this bucket. Now this feature it's calculated for every received bucket. So it will be one if we receive it at this gateway and zero otherwise, spreading factor, frequency, time on air, the device floor for this uh, uh, sensor, and the SNR, the receive SNR at gateway, uh, at each gateway, the RSSI at the same time. And here we calculated, um, we found it useful to increase the, the, the accuracy. To calculate the difference between the RSS, the receive RSSI and SNR between the gateways, for example, this is the difference between the uh, receive RSSI between gateway uh, 140 and 139. And here is the main gateway. Is, uh, it will tell you that um, most of the time, this um, this node will. Uh, deliver the highest RSSI to this gateway and the distance. Now this distance, when they installed the, um, the sensor, they calculated uh, the distance to each gateway, but 
Now, our main objective is to have a classifier. And every time I'm receiving a packet without looking to its ID, and before consuming this packet, I want to know what is the source of this packet. Is it uh, one of my uh, nodes uh, net, uh, within my network or not? So, but I can't use this, uh, let's say, features, the distance, because it will be clear when every one you included the distance to it, uh, it, it will tell you it belongs to this uh, sensor. But we found that because we found it in the, the uh, <clears throat> data set, it's very useful to learn the, the mapping between the received characteristic, the uh, remaining metadata, and the distance. So every time we receive all of this <coughs> metadata, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we receive all of this metadata, and we already know uh, the distance for this device. So we are just uh, build a regressor to, uh, whenever I, I give him the, this metadata to tell me uh, an estimate position for uh, this sensor, distance for each gateway. Then after that, I will add, I receive the, the, the bucket, I extract the first, the 23 features, then I um, enter to the regressor, I calculate the distance, I aggregate it with the input feature, to be like an input for the uh, classifier to tell me what is the device ID for the uh, for um, this feature vector. This is the system model. We um, we suppose that uh, every sensor cover at least by two gateways we will uh, have a very good accuracy. But it will, uh, it will be better to have three gateways cover every sensor within our network, transmitting the data to the network server. And on the application, before consuming uh, the data on the application layer, it will be passed within uh, first the pre processing phase, reading the bucket, feature extraction. Then uh, after that, I will filter the data uh, related to the SMR and RSSI, then do normalization for all uh, the features. After that, I will get the 23 uh, features that we saw them. I will estimate the distance, then I will uh, add it to the uh, remaining features to uh, classify, uh, to tell me this feature, uh, Victor, to which device it belongs. Um, now for testing, we tested, we have two types of tests. We split the data set uh, uh, for the regression, for training the regression, 136 and 20 sensor. Now test one, assume in the group one, these are the sensor, um, Collaborate in the training. Uh, she, uh, we use them for training the model, and we split this uh, this data set as usual for training, validation, and testing. Now, the part of the data that we take it from the first group to test uh, the model, this is what we call it test one, but it's taken from Sensor, they are already used to um, to train the model. Even we are not using them in validation or a training, but from the same source. But that one T sensor, these sensors they are allocating in different, and we have never used their data to uh, <clears throat> in the training. So for this reason, we use uh, for uh, for regressor. We found that. And on test one, you will find that uh, decision tree and random forest do the best. But on the second group, which is the most important for us, because I don't know where is the, 
that Tucker will be allocated and I need my model to be um, generalized, uh, we found that the neural network do uh, the best in uh, both of the methods. Now here we are uh, showing the result after uh, <coughs> after building for a classifier. The first one, when we do the classification based on the collected metadata from one gateway, the green one, uh, two gateways, and uh, the black one is the three gateways, but without the regressor. Because we have a good result, because the, the model here, this data, they already used to train the, the regressor. And the, the information of the position, it's already embedded in this data. Because of that, we don't see a big difference between uh, with regressor and without it, but this difference uh, matter a lot for us. Uh, on the classification, uh, we do the following. We choose a 30 sensor uh, to make it easy for uh, uh, showing the result. Uh, 29 sensor from, uh, we assume that we have in our network 29 sensor and 30 classes. The, usually in, in, in other works, they will just show the idea of uh, without representing, without adding a class to represent the attacker. So it's just to tell you, okay, this data belongs to one of these uh, sensors. But if you bring um, data from the second group, which is that there are sensor not collaborating in uh, training the sensor, it will fail. So in the same way, the 30 sensor, uh, we choose them to represent the attacker. First group, we use, uh, we uh, mix their data, use them to represent one class uh, added to the 29 to become 30 classes. And the second group, uh, group we wanted to, uh, to have it like uh, uh, in the same idea for the second test. And this is uh, some information about the structure of uh, the network. And this is the final. Yes, please. Exactly. That you care about. They will create an extra class that is the that is not a true sensor. Exactly, attacker. I bring thirty sensor, a different position like an attacker. But I don't want to use all of this sensor to represent the class because I will cheat myself. I'm no, using. So that's what I'm trying to do. So basically, the idea basically is that 29 sensors will be just each one of the two sensors, and the other ones they will have a various parts. Exactly. Okay. Now here is the from zero to 28 is the. Uh, network sensor and 29 is the, uh, the attacker sensor. Now, if we look for the accuracy here, we don't see it 100%. It's about uh, 98 uh, and half. But this 98 half for the whole uh, accuracy for all of the classes. But if we look for the, the class that we um, here more, which is 29, which is that Takara class, we will see it that it doesn't overlap. There is no misclassification between this uh, Takara and the remaining nodes. And which means that we are 100% identifying that tax. Uh, the main contribution for us, it's uh, we have a study that effectiveness of gateway redundancy as a tool for increasing network security and to propose a new system model to, um, to enable attacker identification, LoRaWAN. And by this, we are adding uh, a new level for security, a new level of security to uh, LoRaWAN network. And thank you.
or should have people. So to stress, I'm very puzzled that you process the input in the neural That you get the so you say you have the SNR as input and then you take the difference of the SNR. Yes. The this, this so you put the SNR as input and then you put the difference between the SNR as input. Mm -hmm. You have the error as a side and then you have the difference between the SSI. Exactly. Even if you. the whole point of using neural network is not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the difference between this and, and this action. By removing the regressor, even the regressor, if you no, look no, for. The regressor is a difference. We, we can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> because I'm going to see that as it. it. So, but processing the features, I mean, anybody that who say, look with the idea of the neural network and creating a different layer, it's because the layers are going to find the right features for your mm. problem. Exactly. If you're creating the features, then maybe you don't need the neural network. And my whole point there also is you made a huge point about. The random forest and the neural network, the random forest being a little bit worse on the second set. When I look at your results, yeah. they're equal. Between 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, it's three to six. So which which one exactly? Sorry. Forget about the decision. Okay. okay. Which Random one? Forest. Random forest. This one. Okay. We care about more mean absolute error. Okay. So zero eight, zero point zero eight to zero point zero point six. Ah, there is difference between this and this. No, I'm looking about in, in test two, which is interesting one. Yeah, this is test two. So between the first, the first value in the last column and the last value in the in the, yeah, the this one and this one. Yeah, the same. Uh, but, yeah, there is no big difference. But, uh, but my take with this is if you don't process the input one. and then you put the inputs as this, you should be getting exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I will use two price and uh, I, I agree that uh, doing the process, doing the, the, the differences, that doesn't add too much. No, no, nothing. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going. It shouldn't add anything. So that, so my, you could say, hey, even that I'm doing this, I'm adding another feature, and then I need a different, I would need less neurons to do it, or I need a less layer to do it. But the whole point of doing a neural network is that you don't need to think about processing the features. You just give it what you have, and then the neural network will find the features. So, um, and because people already have the inputs that allow you to determine the feature, like the right feature, so the neural network should be able to drive that feature autonomously. If you need it. Right? So, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the results are wrong. I'm saying that. I don't know why you did it, because that's the whole point of using the neural network. Now, we just wanted, uh, for me, I just wanted first to increase the number of features to make the network uh, understand more. I got the idea that they are correlated. It's not that they are correlated. I mean, everything is correlated. It's just because even all the other features are correlated. Okay. This is the, the SNR that you have in, in, in one big group is going to be correlated with the, with, the, with the SNR that you have in the other in the other group. The RSSI is going to be correlated with the SSI. So all of those things are correlated. I'm just, I'm just having a philosophical discussion that once you have those features, and then you say, I want to increase the number of features, increase the number of neurons that you have in the first event. So that's the only thing that I'm, I'm, Yeah, very yeah, good yeah. point. For me, it's, it's possible <clears> that <throat> The same idea, I, I would say it's for the regressor. No, the regressor is a completely different because... Because I already thing, have some information, so I do the supervise. No, the, the only thing that, for me, when you look at this thing, is I would never change this 
I would say, I have a classifier in which in the middle, I'm gonna confuse three intermediate values that might help me learn the solution. So you could present this as a kind of an encoding problem kind of thing, in which you encode information and you have some no information. So for me, I would present this as a, 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 a conditional autosomal. But that is a completely different way. In, but for me, I understand that regressing those three features are going to allow you to learn better the way and then get a better classifier. So for me, that's, I have no problem with doing the regress. Yeah. So, because you have more information and you want to learn that information because you think it's going to be useful for the classifier. Because in your case, for you, the localization is something that you expect that the, the, the attackers are going to be outside. So yeah. those features are going to allow the classifier to not get outside. That's it. And then if you say, hey, but, if but, I can use the location for the classifier, I might be missing something. But from where I calculated these features, so that's why you, that's I calculated them from this, the same one, I will use them for the classifier. And but, wish. but if you ask me, I will learn all of that end to end. It, uh, we did it. That's it. This is in turn. But by adding the regressor and adding the, the, the these features, now even the arrival time, if you, if you, <coughs> If you see here, you don't have the arrival time because it's not accurate in, in, uh, in the data set. By adding the arrival time here, I guess using just the RSSI. Now, we play a little bit about the effective of each one of these, uh, let's say, uh, features on the final result. Now, the main thing is the RSSI. It's the main contribution contributor in the, in, in the final result. For example, receiving the success percentage and the gateway, these these features they are correlated. Everything that is correlated. Um, no, uh, yes. sorry, but for, for example, the, the device explorer, there could be many devices within the, the, the same floor, but we let uh, let's say the device explorer there because it's nothing uh, unique, but there is no correlation between the device explorer and um, that's an R. I don't think that's a thing. When you say end to end, you're training the classifier and the regressor at the same time. When you're training only the regressor and then you do the, the classifier. No, when I'm saying end to end, I'm just using a uh, classifier. So that's not end to end. And then end to end, go back to the previous. That's it. For the end to end is end. You train both levels at the same time. And you're not doing that. You're training, <coughs> you're doing this one first. Yeah. Okay. And then you say, hey, I have a huge, a very good result here. And then you take these features, take these features, and train this classifier. Exactly. Okay. What I'm telling you is instead of putting here 23 features, you put 17 on these six that you created, throw it away. And then you say, hey, I'm going to train. This loss function here, because this localization is going to be very interesting. I'm going to put a skip connection here with this, and then I'm going to have another neural network here to train this. Ah. And then you train the full thing end to end. Okay, and then you have the first loss function is the error here, the classification error. Then you put another error here with some parameters about the localization error. Mm -hmm. And you put whatever uh, regularize that you want to do. And then you train that into it. You don't need to do it separate. You don't need to add anything extra. Yeah, what, what, what I did, in, 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 like result in to end, I mean just the uh, 23 uh, for the classifier, because this is the, the what I care about it. And I did it because I, I removed this because I, not, I, I want to see what is the effectiveness of adding the regressor. So for this reason, in this way, we can see that by adding the regressor, we gain more. But really? maybe with end-to-end, -end, uh, we gain a little Which bit I, more. I think things are going to train faster. <coughs> but 
I am dealing with little that, that the data from the localization nodes. Yeah. Because if you look at it, if you go back to the one that I said, what you're gonna have here is in here you have your classifier loss only, and then you have this input here. Yeah. But then if you have two losses, you have a loss for this one, and you have a loss for this one, both of them together, it's gonna help train this regressor that when you're training this classifier is fixed. Okay. So there's gonna be information from here, back propagating all the way to here. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. So Perfect. this is gonna do a better job because at the end of the day, for you, you <laughs> train this only to get these features. Yeah. And that's only an intermediate value. If you train the whole thing, there's gonna be leakage of information from here to <laughs> here that you don't have right now. So the regressor at the end, you care a little bit about this thing, but what you really care is about that muscle. So you can train the whole thing. Yeah. And then you have two loss functions, that one and this one. And you could see this one as a skip connection. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Thank you. But I think at the end you're gonna get the same result. <laughs> no, I, I think there will be a bias proof that this by training this at the same time this will affect on that for, for sure yeah, because you are. Factor, but I think it should be it would be a normal way of it. Can I have a question? And I like it. You see that I was the negative. Uh, no, no, no. So, I, I completely agree that, uh, as I told you, we, I don't know, I added just to, uh, to increase the number of. Uh, yeah, but increasing, again, I, my, my thing is that you have to have the whole point of view of the is that you don't need to do more. Like so, if, if you believe that you need more, you increase the number of people. Okay. That's, that would be what. Now, if I understand what you're saying, so you're saying that it's more convenient to train the entire network as a whole rather than splitting the brain in two parts, right? Mm -hmm. but sometimes ago, we tried on totally different forms, right? We first train in an unsupervised manner a uh, neural network to extract some feature from the input data, and then use those features as an input to a classifier that tells us whether the, the input was from a video, a static video or a dynamic video, right? Then we compare this approach with an approach where we try to train the entire things from scratch, from the whole data. And actually, the results were better with the first approach. Maybe we did something wrong. You know, so. No. So the question there would be is if you do the unsupervised training at the beginning, it's probably unsupervised, and you have many more, much more data to train the whole thing. Okay. And then you say, I'm going to train the classifier from the last step. And that is probably better than training everything in here. But probably the best thing that you can do is you do a supervised training first. Okay. And then you do the supervised training, and then fine tune the supervised training so the features are better. Because the problem when you try to do everything in here is that you throw away all your unsupervised data that you have at the beginning. And, you're and your memory right. might be too large in you know, the no, That's right. This is the difference because we have an unsupervised training first. Without any debate of that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, all basically the language models, when you look at it, you train the language model, the DBT3 or the bird, you train in a very, uh, with a very dummy task that is not interesting. Is, I'm going to train the DBT3, is trying to play the network, and the bird is to play a mask work, and that's the uh, thing. Right. But then, whenever you want to then solve a task, which is a question answering, you say, it's not only that I'm going to train the last layer in order to predict the answer to the question, but I'm going to fine tune the whole model because then the features are going to be better tuned to your problem. Yes. And the whole point in GPT 3 when you look at it, is you say, look, I can do zero shot, no fine training, one shot, and there is a little bit, or the uh, very few shot training that then see a little bit. Right? So the thing that you could do is you could do, hey, I'm going to do the regressor first. So I have a group regression to start with, and then whenever you have the classifier, you keep on training the classifier. But then saying, even that I want the classifier to be as good as possible, 
let me back propagate the error for the classifier into the reverse. And then you get a better yeah. reverse. And then train everything. In. So doing that, the viral encounter is But at the end of the day, the best thing is to fine tune the initial one because you might not, at the end, maybe you get a, a worse performance in the three features, but you get a better performance in the classification, which at the end is what you get. Right. So another point, uh, so far as I understand, you basically, at the end of the day, what you try to do is check the position of the center, right? Exactly. Look, I'm doing the localization, but instead of doing it uh, on the node, you want to do it on the cloud. Right. Uh, because, you know, this idea of collecting you know, SSI measurements from different anchors whose position is known, and you will process the data that you collect from these receivers, and you use this data to create a map to classify them, right? It's called fingerprinting localization, right? I mean, how therefore? Uh, for a long, but it's for the low level, uh, the, the way of processing the data there, there um, there's many stages for the weight, which is uh, the IQ samples, uh, this stuff, uh, they are looking for the spectrum and uh, other works looking for the window. Now here, even I'm um, left the time because I, as I, I mentioned from the beginning, if I am the attacker, I will study the network, then I will study the behavior button for this sensor, then I will generate the same. So having um, studying with a window time, it's uh, Tuesdays. I want uh, um, time independent, let's say, to decide when I'm receiving the packet immediately without storing or using the packet for to decide later with um, other inform aggregating other information to uh, take the decision. Now, uh, we have in this direction actually. Uh, not use the data in, in, in the way we process it, let's say. Uh, there are more complexity for them. It needs special receiver, a uh, special antenna for uh, getting the the data, even some of them, the, the phase arrival and uh, and all all of this stuff. So, what we are looking at, uh, the company, we don't want to go for complexity. We always want something easy, and we don't want to update the um, the Laura one uh, picture because we are we having a lot of sensor, and we just. So you want you something to a, plug in. You don't keep a data because of the, the measurements that you do like those are made for some of the sensors. It's somehow embedded in the new name of the classifier. Now, if I train this one, for example, and I'm done, one, this is required just one day, even if we are looking for uh, example for a six month. But usually in an industry, when you go to install a sensor, um, there are, there are uh, the beginning in the beginning phase. Uh, there are some measurements we do it usually. Uh, then we uh, specify okay, this is the best parameter for, for this sensor. One uh, methodology it could be like this: we transmitting many uh, messages at the first day, for example. We just want to know um, how it's the behavior button for one day, not one week many messages at the, at the beginning then uh, by this because here we are not we are not looking for a button we are not we are just getting the relation between uh, the correlation between the receive uh, signal characteristic between the three gateways even if it's time dependent but if, if we assume that that the, the environment is started in some way mm -hmm. That change will happen during the day. Uh, it will not affect if something happened during the night. Because if you look for the RSSI, for example, during the day you will find it low, but during the night it will go up because uh, less people are using uh, radio. Now it will affect the three gateways. It will not affect just one of them. 
So night, uh, Sunday, Monday, it will not affect the, the, the final delivery. So for this reason, we uh, we take it in, in this way. And uh, according to our knowledge, none, none uh, have uh, tracked track it uh, in this way. Thank you. Something else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.